Hello, I'm Dr. Damien Dauphiné. And I'm Dr. Rafi Hussein. And we are the, the Pod, Pod Doctors. Doctors. We are going to uh, delve into a, a really common problem that we see every day, plantar fasciitis or, or heel pain. And um, I think one of the things I did want to mention before we get going is we're going to, we're again talking about you know, some visuals and some images that we're, we're looking at that you can't see if you're just listening to a podcast. So I want to remind everybody that we do have all of this stuff on YouTube and now we're on Spotify, Apple uh, podcasts. We're going to be up on Stitcher. We're already on Podbean, um, Google, the Google podcast platform should be any day now. So just uh, realize that uh, if you do, if you're not listening to this in the car and you do want to see the, what we're looking at, which I think would be helpful, uh, you can go to YouTube and, and find us on YouTube uh, at the Pod Doctors. Um, so uh, without further delay, Dr. Hussein, let's uh, jump into here. Uh, plantar fasciitis, one of the most common things we treat every single day in the office. Yeah, I mean, ultra common. Patient comes in with heel pain. I mean... If I'm seeing, what, like 20 patients, I'm seeing maybe five or six plantar fasciitis. What would you say? Uh, if I'm seeing 30 patients a day, I'm going to see 10 or 12 that are plantar fasciitis patients. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a third of what we see on a daily basis. It's just extremely common. And that, that could be different based on where you are. The city that we're in, there's a couple colleges, a lot of sports teams, a lot of young athletic people. So it is fairly common in the... You know, population that we're in. I like to say it doesn't discriminate. It, it, it'll <laughs> attack. It doesn't matter who you are, young, old, um, you can end up with plantar fasciitis at some point. And I think one of the things that's, that we, we notice about heel pain is the pediatric version called Seavers disease is not usually related to weight, but I'm seeing kids who are obese now having maybe a touch of Seavers, but have classic plantar fasciitis because they're obese. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of scary because that shouldn't happen when you're 10 or 12 years old. Yeah, so just like Dr. D said, there are multiple reasons you can have heel pain. Most common being plantar fasciitis, but it could also be Seavers disease, which is your growing planes. It could be... Pediat you know, a pediatric version, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of calcium apophysitis. Mm -hmm. It could be Baxter's nerve entrapment. It could be tarsal tunnel syndrome. Sure. It could be Achilles tendonitis. That could... That's more towards the posterior aspect mm -hmm. of the heel, the, the back of your heel, rather than the bottom. There's some evidence to support uh, rheumatoid nodules causing pain in that area as well. So you, you, you can get that in some patients who have pretty severe rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, you can see that um, myositis ossificans where they get the mm -hmm. multiple spurs. and Right. Just, just bone uh, collections of, of ossification centers in the middle of the muscle or in the, yeah, in the middle of the calf or in the middle of the plantar fascia. Yep. Yeah, so... Back in the day, people used to say, I have heel spurs. And the heel spur, per se, is not necessarily the cause of the problem. Um, patients come in, like I said, heel pain, most common time is early in the morning. They can notice it whenever they get out of their car after a long drive. If they've been sitting for a while and they stand up, that's that post-static dyskinesia. The pain is actually the ligament that's attached to that spur. The origin of the plantar fascia is the heel. My little foot model. The heel bone connected to the toes via the plantar fascia. Now, every time you step down, it stretches that plantar fascia, and it becomes angry and inflamed. And that, and that, that that's a normal part, right? The, the plantar yeah. fascia is supposed to be absorbing some shock. It's like a, it's like a suspension bridge. Exactly. So we don't want to to negate the fact that there's some there's a normal process there that's supposed to happen but i, th I think when you overload it and i think the these next few slides we're going to talk about aquinas because aquinas is the root of all evil um you know once we get through some of the descriptions here of the anatomy you, you've got you've got a tremendous picture there um showing the three bands so let's talk about the, the three bands so three bands make up the plantar fascia the medial band the most common that's injured the central band, the second most common, and then the lateral band. That's the least common injured. 
Now the origin where it originates off the heel bone, your calcaneus, where you see the heel spurs, is where it gets inflamed and angry and painful. Uh, the studies here estimate that you're seeing about 50 you know, plus percent of getting pain at that site. But I think clinically when I'm looking at them, I'd say 80 plus percent. What would you say? Medial plantar. The medial plantar or yeah. the heel bone. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's the attachment site. That's the weakest link apparently. Um, you know, so that's certainly where we see most of that, most of that pain. Now you can see it out into the, what we call the mid substance where it's out in the mid arch. Um, you've got four layers of muscle there, but, but usually it's that fascia that's inflamed. But that's the thing, you know, people are like, well, why can't we just, you know, eliminate it and, and cut it and get rid of all the stuff that attaches at the heel? But you've got four layers of muscle there you can see underneath the fascia that are vital and that have function. And you can't, Steinler stripping is not usually a good idea. That was a procedure that was done, I think, you know, 50 years ago and beyond and was releasing everything on the heel and uh, unnecessary and probably uh, debilitating. So not, not such a great idea. And you also have vessels and nerves that yeah, run through there. right. I mean, that's... It's not something you want to get a scalpel into and just go whack, whack all that stuff. Uh, you know, so I, th I think you're describing it beautifully. Um, this is a great picture here. You've got a picture, a, a lateral or side view of the foot showing the, the areas where things can get inflamed, and that, that's classic. So the most common cause of plantar fasciitis, when you have a tight Achilles, which is called equinus, that heel bone... I keep on tossing this. <laughs> the heel bone uh, comes down, attached by the Achilles, attached by the plantar fascia. When the Achilles is tight, it's pulling that heel bone up. Angry inflammation because now you're collapsing that arch. And you're, you're stretching that distance between A and B. So if A is the heel and B is out in your toes, when the arch comes down, even a couple of degrees, yes, you're lengthening that distance. And this structure doesn't... It's not elastic like a rubber band. There is some elasticity to it that we lose as we get older, that we lose if we glycosylate everything with diabetes. So th those tissues get stiffer as we get older, and that's why you really see this as a problem between people in their late 40s, early 50s, uh, who are trying to stay active, trying to be weekend warriors, and they're, and they're ending up with classic s symptoms of this. And it's usually because, as you said, they're not stretching every day. They're losing that range of motion at the ankle, and it's causing biomechanical problems. These, these uh, illustrations on the right side of the screen here are beautiful because it's showing what happens to the bony structure with Aquinas. And it's, it's literally deforming the arch. And that's causing you to stretch the plantar fascia beyond its capacity, where, and it starts to tear at the, at the insertion at the heel. Just classic. So we can eliminate that variable by getting people to stretch the calf muscle. So, I mean, I, I'm really aggressive with that. I don't, I'm oh, not, yeah. The pro stretch device, you know, I'm not, they're not sponsoring us. I'm going to throw them a, a plug. I'm going to give them a shout out that that silly piece of blue plastic is my secret weapon. If I can get people using that thing and, and lengthen the calf muscle by stretch, by doing stretches in, in a very specific way where you, it's almost a yoga theory. You're relaxed. You're letting gravity do the work for you. This is a semicircular plastic device that you rock back on while you're standing on it. Um, and, and we can put a link to it maybe. Um, I think I have a picture in here. you have a picture? Great. So that, that, I swear, is the biggest reason I can keep people from letting this plague them the rest of their lives. If I can get them into an orthotic, get them stretching, get them into some decent running shoes, that's, that's like, you know, 90% of the problem right there. And the stretching we're talking about is going to be aimed at plantar fascia and Achilles stretching. The Achilles yeah, I, stretching, and I really think it's it's the calf muscle. I mean, it's re you're really if you yeah. look really deeply into what you're stretching, you're stretching muscle tissue because you're not going to get a whole lot of uh, leeway in the Achilles itself or the plantar fascia. So I mean, I, you really focus, and it's and it's that's like you decide, like you described before, that disconnect with patients where they maybe don't quite understand why we focus on the calf muscle. My problem is at my heel. It's an indirect way of controlling the mechanics that are causing it. That's really huge. And if you can get people to get that connection, then they understand. So what's your treatment protocol on average? Stretching, good shoes, good insoles, a night splint, which is a stretching device. I call it my personal favorite torture device. But they were great. That, that is, that I, I like to explain it as that's keeping gains that you're getting from your stretching regimen. Because at night, 
if things are contracting like you normally would, your your foot's fully plantar flexed because you're unconscious. <laughs> Hopefully, you're sleeping. You're you're getting some good REM uh, REM sleep, and the night splint is holding your foot in a position where the plantar fascia is healing, uh, almost in a stretched out, ready to go position, so that you're not re-injuring it. Because that morning pain is literally re-injury every single morning. You're tearing new attachments that are trying to heal at night. So th- that vicious cycle, you got to break. And the night splint and a steroid injection icing, you know, that that kind of regimen, maybe an oral anti-inflammatory like a leave or ibuprofen, that's really how you break that cycle. Yeah, so after our conservative therapy, we talk about steroid injections, if that fails, physical therapy, and then finally surgery. But I don't think you have to do these things in, in, order. in series. They can be yeah. done in parallel, absolutely. And I think we're all doing that because it is a problem that requires the shotgun approach, and I know you feel the same. You've got to hit them with everything but the kitchen sink, and you yeah. got to do it all at the same time. We're not doing a study. If I was doing a study with six variables, that would be a nightmare. It would be hard to isolate, which was the important variable, right? Yeah. But we're not. We just want to get rid of your pain and get you back to your activities. Yeah. So classically, I personally will do stretches, good shoes, good insoles. We'll talk about orthotics, a night splint. And if it's bad enough, I recommend a heel injection. If it's not too bad... We can always wait, but usually these three or four things go hand in hand. Yes, the, the a steroid shot um, works beautifully. We use ethyl chloride, which is a freeze spray that yeah. numbs up the skin a little bit. It makes that injection far less painful. And we're not going through the bottom of the foot. We're going through the side where there are fewer nerve endings. It's much less painful. And I think people get freaked out because I still think they're the same primary care doctors that are probably injecting toes for ingrown toenails to the end of the toe we, we have an ingrown toenail one coming up where we talk about that it's just not necessary neither is going through the bottom of the foot to get to the point where you want to put the steroid you can go through the side where there are fewer nerve endings yeah show that so here's your foot we come in from the side i typically will go above and below the plantar mm-hmm. fascia some people go above some people below as long as it gets there it all works. It needs to get into the neighborhood. It doesn't have to be you know, absolutely precise. Yeah. I, at least that's the way I feel about it. I know there are folks that like to use ultrasound to do you know, ultrasound guided. You know, if that's your thing, that's fine. I know it's reimbursable. Um, that's, <laughs> that's great. But uh, it, I, I, you, you clearly don't have to be absolutely precise with it to have the impact that you're looking for. And the more they walk on it, the more it's going to dissipate to that area. Mm-hmm. Some adjuncts that we use, MLS laser... PRP injection, stem cell therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy. These let's, are things to help. Yeah, let's and let's go into that. let's do a so, little more deep into those. So well, no, let's go back before you before you go through that. Let's let's discuss some of those. Do you have those coming up? I do have them. Oh, coming. okay, gotcha. I don't want to steal your thunder. Good. I got you. We're coming back to it. All right, because those are really important adjuncts. So stretching. These are some simple stretches. If you have plantar fasciitis, take a picture of this screen. Calf stretch. My all-time favorite stretch. I tell patients to do this so much that your friends and family think you've gone crazy. (laughs) The towel stretch, very good, very effective. First thing in the morning, big towel over the toes, crank it back. It takes that initial heel pain um, out of the question. It it can help. I think all of these are adjunctive to the pro stretch device. I think the pro stretch device is by far going to give you a more aggressive stretch. But these are things you can do throughout the day. And I think the towel stretch before you get out of bed is a nice way to just prevent some of that rebound effect that you're getting when you're tearing all those new attachments by putting your foot on the ground. So, yeah, I and mean, I think that's important. I, even when, when we're treating people, the other thing we recommend is clearly avoid going barefoot around your house, especially if you have hardwood floors and tile. So you have to kind of get into the, uh, the, the idea that if you're going to use like a house shoe, make it like a clog, a really good quality slip something on. Something with an arch. Some, well, well, hopefully you're using orthotics in that and you need to move them from shoe to shoe. So my suggestion is Merrill makes a great clog that has an insert that comes out. If, they, peop, if folks don't want to wear their outdoor shoes inside, I have them get a pair of these Merrill clogs, take the insert out, put in their orthotic and have that right by the bed. So they slip those on when they got to, you know, pee in the middle of the night. I got to go get something to drink. But it, if you're that sort of regimented about it, 
you're going to get rid of your heel pain pretty quickly. If you finagle it and you do a lot of walking around the house and you think it's on carpet, it shouldn't be bothersome, and your pain lasts for six or eight months, you got your own self to, to blame. I so. think people think that they have like a bruise or a heel spur and they're walking on something soft and it's going to get better. Mm -hmm. The problem isn't that you're walking on stones. The problem is that your arch is collapsing right. every time you step down. And, and we clearly know from taking x-rays of folks for completely unrelated problems who have massive heel spurs and have never, ever had heel pain. So we know the spur is not the source of the pain, probably 99.9% .9 of the time. The only time I've blamed the spur for heel pain have been in, in a few extremely elderly patients who have zero fat pad yeah. left in their fat heel. Fat pad atrophy? Yeah. You're going to have heel pain. And they're like 95. You know, this patient's like 95 years old. They've clearly outlived their fat pad. Um, that's the only time where I will blame the, the heel pad as the problem and the, the bony structure underneath and get them into a heel cup, a, a rubber heel cup. Um, Orthotics. Yes. So rubber heel cup works good, but it's not an orthotic. Right. An orthotic is going to give you support along your whole arch. It's not just an arch support. It's physically controlling your heel bone, controlling your subtalar joint, keeping you neutral so your arch doesn't unlock or pronate. Um, it doesn't collapse whenever you're stepping. It's going to keep good tension on that plantar fascia without letting the plantar fascia getting excessively stretched so you're still going to pronate a little bit you're going to get yeah. some shock absorption out of it but it's going to keep you from going past a certain point and i think this picture on the upper left is great it's showing what the power of the orthotic is it's realigning the rear foot and at the same time it's protecting the plantar fascia from getting overused i mean we can do a whole lecture about lower back pain and orthotics when you have anterior pelvic tilt that's when most people have lower back pain and a simple orthotic uh, can reduce that. I'm not saying it's going to fix it completely, but there's um, biomechanics that can go into this. I mean, we can talk about tibial rotation and the whole shebang, but um, that's we, a whole other We like to keep our listeners, so I think we should probably <laughs> point that. I, I played ping pong through most of my biomechanics lectures, so <laughs> yeah, that's it's just a really dry subject for me personally, but... Um, yeah, I think it's excruciatingly important that or that some sort of orthotic device be included in this for the long term solution, and that's why the 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 stuff that people come in with that's over the counter is is designed not to hurt people because these companies don't want to get sued, and so they're very flexible. The I don't want to mention any names, but we know the 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 doctor most who, common yes, who, the doctor who's behind many foot and ankle products, who's uh, yeah, whose corporation donated money to the Illinois College of Podiatric Medicine back in the 80s, and they now they named the school after him. <clears throat> Having said that, I don't use a lot of their products, if any. And these, these orthotics that we prescribe have to be made out of polypropylene. They have to be somewhat rigid. Maybe not carbon fiber rigid, but they have to have a little bit of give, but mostly support. And the stuff that people come in with off the shelf just simply can't do that. I yeah. tell them, if you can flex it with your hands... Don't get it. It needs to be solid enough. It needs to be solid enough that when you step down, it's not going to collapse. Correct. Yep. And if you can fold, that's one other thing we should talk about really quickly. If you if you can fold your shoe in half, if you're wearing a pair of Skechers, uh, I'm going to throw them under the bus. That's okay. They're not sponsoring the show. Or you fold those in half. If you can fold your athletic shoes in half, that is going to be such a contributor to excessive motion at the midfoot. It's going to allow Aquinas to collapse your arch even further, and it doesn't work well with the orthotic. What you want is a shoe that breaks only at the ball of the foot, where a shoe should break. At the big toe joint. Exactly. And if you've got that married with an orthotic, that's a, a very powerful combination, and that, that's going to be your long-term solution, I think. I think there's been a trend recently regarding flexible shoe gear. It's... Flexible, barefoot running, feel the ground. They show them flexing so much that, in general, it's horrible for your feet. Well, I think the original thought process, though, was that that was going to be 10% of your training. So if you're if you're a, a serious runner and you went to a, a free, whoever free shoe, in other words, a barefoot running type shoe that's very flexible, I, the intent was not to have that be your sole training shoe. 
because that's going to cause stress fractures, plantar fasciitis, all kinds of other problems. And, and I think the thought process was if you do that for 10 or 15% of your training, you're going to be able to strengthen some of the intrinsic muscles in the foot, and that's probably a good thing. Totally agree with that. But I think when those came out, people just went to those exclusively, thinking they're going to get back to nature or something, and, and they're coming in with all these nagging injuries that are, were completely preventable if they just wore some decent running shoes. There's a reason why these athletes will train in different shoes and then do their events in flats and spikes and, right. and yeah. cleats and whatnot. Absolutely. But, but you can't, you, yeah, you can't train in those seven days a week. You're just, you're going to cause all kinds of problems. Night splints. So a night splint is a stretching device that we use to help stretch the plantar fascia and more importantly, the Achilles, the, the gastrocnemius muscle and the soleus muscle. Mm. Um, there's multiple, di- uh, Styles, I don't know. Sure. Whatever you want to call them. Uh, my personal favorite is the posterior. I know you like the dorsal. Just from the standpoint that, that people seem to be able to sleep in them a little bit easier. There's a sock uh, version. Yeah. The They're s- all decent. The, s- the sock version uh, is called Strasburg sock. There's probably multiple options, but I've actually tried to use that myself, and it, it was very uncomfortable. So some people can get away with that. Some people just tugging on the toes like that, the thing in the middle there. Uh, can drive you nuts. So um, it's really whatever you think you will be compliant with. So, you know, we have the, the dorsal night splints on the left there. We have a version of that here in the office. But if that's not working for the patient, then we kind of sit them out and have them find something that they can experiment with. Yeah, they all work. The main important part of this is just to use it. Right. A lot of patients will be like, oh, I used it yesterday. And then the Monday before that, and consistency is key. Right. We're trying to stretch something, and you're spending maybe an hour or two in this. The more, the better. If you can sleep with it on and sleep, what, six hours, that's phenomenal stretching that you're getting there. Right. I think you're keeping the gains that you're getting from using things like the pro stretch or the, or the wall stretch. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way I look at it. So heel injections. Here I put in pictures for the ultrasound guided so you can kind of see what we're talking about, the anatomy. Um, But what we do, steroid shot, cortisone, to the heel, where the plantar fascia is originating from, usually the site of the most pain. Sometimes you go above and below, sometimes you go into it, um, but usually we'll come immediately, and you can see uh, in that picture of the x-ray, the heel spur where they have that circle in the arrow, that's where people are aiming for. I think the other thing that's nice about using ultrasound is that you can actually measure the thickness of the plantar fascia. Yeah. Um, Steve Barrett, one of our colleagues, published a paper just looking at the thickness and how it correlated with whether people were responding to conservative therapies, non-surgical therapies. And, and you know, he, he found that, you know, after a certain thickness... Four millimeters. Yeah, these folks just didn't do well with conservative treatment, and that's where you ought to consider doing something more, either a, fasci- a fasciotomy or uh, I think in our case, I'm, I'm big on using um, a micro debrider and then yep. covering that with amniotic tissue, so topaz micro debrider or whatever micro debrider you want to use, uh, rather than, than releasing the plantar fascia. So that's the difference between plantar fasciitis and plantar fasciosis. Right. Itis meaning acute, something that recently started, and if this is something chronic, you're probably looking towards plantar fasciosis. Right, and, and it's, that's more of a degenerative problem. And that, that can really change your, your thought process on how you're attacking this for sure because those are the folks that, that it lingers. Those are the people that I, I try to go to the laser sooner because the laser may be causing some biochemical changes in the, in the cellular structure that's allowing the body to go in and start fixing it. Those are the folks that I'm thinking, you know, regenerative medicine, I'm thinking stem cell injections. I'm thinking, you know, going in and doing the microdebridement and then... To revert yeah. all that scar tissue. Right. And, and, and get the body to start laying down good collagen. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into surgery, um, let's talk about some physical therapy. So physical therapy is wonderful. I'm a big advocate. I think it works great. I think it forces people to do their stretches when they're not doing them at home. Right. There's a lot of adjunct things you can do, uh, taping, strapping, ultrasound, you know, Paraffin wax. I mean, I don't know what else they do there. I like the kinesio tape when people yeah. come in with both Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis, and it's both of them are raging. Uh, 
that in combination of, with just simply getting them off that limb. I mean, that, yeah. those folks who come in that inflamed, they have to understand that if they continue to use that part, you have to think of this as a broken, broken foot or a broken part of your body that you're still abusing. When it's that bad, you have to get them off of it. I mean, that's where we go knee scooter crutches yeah. uh, and just try to eliminate the, the use of the part to let everything calm down. Then you can focus on, okay, we got the Achilles tendonitis to calm down. Now we can just focus on the plantar fasciitis. When it's both or when it's bilaterally, when it's both right and left foot and their Achilles are inflamed and their plantar fasciitis are inflamed, those you are really tough to treat. So I, what do you do in that case? I mean, in, in your practice. So, <laughs> just shoot them. Yeah, just uh, yeah. you're done. We're gonna take them out back. <laughs> um, I'll go to the boot. I yeah. think it works great. But if it's bilat, so I put have them in them, two of them. I have them pick whichever one's the worst. Yeah, and I have them calm down using the boot. Um, crutches, knee scooter, I think are phenomenal. Slam dunks. Right. Um, but bilaterally, if they're even, that's uh, tough. Yeah, you got to pick one side and try to get it better, and then go for the other side i agree with you it's tough because the other option is you just put them in a wheelchair yeah and that and no one wants to do that that's uh, unless you're you know on death's door nobody wants to do that so extra corporal shockwave therapy what do you think about this i i think it, it it's it certainly has its role i think the issue has always been reimbursement uh there are certainly some studies that show that it's that it has benefit. I've used it in the past, and it's been it's been helpful. We used it both in the operating room, and then also there was a version we could use in the office. But again, I think the issue has been reimbursement. There are some studies that were published that weren't that well done, but but that the insurance industry liked to hang on to, and used it as a way of avoiding payment for this technology. But um, you know, I'm hopeful that it'll be easier to use in the future where we've got a, 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 you know, a straightforward reimbursement code for it and that we can do it in the office uh, with local anesthetic. Um, that would be fantastic. I just don't know that, that that time has come yet. As far as I'm aware, there's still no uh, easily uh, usable CPT code or, or, or procedural code for this that all insurances are covering. So Now, this isn't an electric shock. Uh, I just want you to understand that. Right. What it does is it shoots a tiny little piston, piston, piston. Yeah. <laughs> against the heel bone uh, at excessive speed, which s- breaks down that scar tissue, uh, promotes blood flow. And that, it, that, that picture where it's showing cavitation—that's what it, that, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. The cavitation is the term for that wave, that energy wave moving through the soft tissues. Yeah. And you can penetrate up to forty millimeters, which you know is way more than you even need to get to the plantar fascia. So the, I think great the great thing to use. I just wish we had an uh, easier way of using it. Therapeutic ultrasound, typically done in like physical therapy mm-hmm. office or physical medicine and rehabilitation office. Um, we don't do them here. They work great. I think it has its purpose. It breaks down that scar tissue, just like the extracorporeal shockwave therapy. And you can even have your physical therapist use you know topical. Uh, and said with it or yeah. a topical steroid with it and it can drive that through the skin so it, it can be helpful for really really severe cases so surgery so there's multiple surgical options as far as going in treating the plantar fascia typically it's around lengthening or releasing the plantar fascia and, and, and again this is less than two percent in my practice in 21 yeah. years of doing this this is less than two percent of the people who have plantar fasciitis so I don't know about I don't know about yeah. you, but it's I it's a patients, small percentage. One to twenty, one to thirty, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. So let's go through the different options. Endoscopic, probably the most common way. We go in just like how we scope your knees, scope your ankles, small port. We go in, identify the plantar fascia, and release it. Some people do a third. Some people do half. Some people do the whole thing. Um, I'm usually on the two third side. I don't know your perfect. I, I I've not done these in decades, and the reason being, um, I I've had such good success with the de- microdebridement and adding the amniotic tissue, and the other reason is, uh, with my peripheral nerve referral practice, I see, it's it's at least two or three a year, where 
the portal's been placed in the wrong place and they've lacerated the medial and lateral plantar nerve or one, yeah. or, one or both. I remember you told me about yeah. that like a month ago. Yeah, there's, there's, and, and that's a devastating injury um, requiring microvascular repair that, um, you know, is reliant on how quickly you get to it sometimes uh, because now you've, you've denervated intrinsic muscles in the arch. So, uh, so, you know, it can lead to complete numbness on the bottom of the foot, but it can also denervate some of these muscles that we, that, that clearly have function for the foot. So I'm, I'm a little concerned. It's a, it's a easy procedure. Um, the other thing is you can cause something called cuboid syndrome if you release too much of the plantar fascia. Yeah. So it, it's, it's definitely a tried and true procedure, but even the doc who invented it doesn't do it anymore. Oh, wow. So that's something to consider. Um, one of them. So one of the guys that invented it uh, or, or really helped develop it um, instrumentationally uh, doesn't do them anymore. So I, I, that should tell you something. Um, I, I'm not throwing it under the bus completely because I think there are patients who benefit from it clearly. Um, but I, I like the fact that we could uh, turn a fasciosis patient around by using regenerative medicine and, and using amniotic tissue that has growth factors after you've injured the tissue in a controlled fashion and that is poking a bunch of holes in it or, or using the you know the 10x device where you're debriding it so yeah beautiful yeah yeah there you go so i think i think there are other options out there it's not and and, I, and if i have to do a fasciotomy i'm still an instep uh, which is what you've shown here where you're making a small incision you're visualizing the ligament and there's no risk to the to the medial and lateral plantar nerve this way and with this technique, you could probably take out a portion like they yeah, recommend. Yeah, and I do. I like to take out a section and I cauterize both sides. So it's it's probably going to grow back, but it's definitely going to grow back in a lengthened position. And while you're in there, I've seen docs go in and remove that plantar spur. What is your thought I, on that? I, I'm not anywhere near that because uh, I'm going in front of the weight-bearing surface a, a few centimeters and... And like I said, I, I just don't find that the spur is the source of pain. So I'm, I'm not in favor of that. I've, I've actually seen um, patients who've had that done in a very aggressive manner, and they've now, then they've had a fracture from the spur out up into the subtalar joint. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if you get too crazy with it, you can, you can injure enough of the cortical bone that can weaken it and lead to some really crazy fractures. So we, we actually saw a couple of those when I was in residency, but I haven't seen that that sits wow but you know again I, I think if we really thought the spur was a huge part of the problem still in 2020 i would spend more time dealing with it but i, I just don't find that it is so the next uh treatment option the topaz like dr d was telling you about yeah this is really cool you can use it for all kinds of ligamentous and tendinous problems it's great for achilles tendonitis or tendinosis yeah. that's not that's not responding we've used it for perineus brevis tendon tendinitis slash tendinosis um, and then plantar fasciitis. I like to still open it up. You can do this matrix of poke, poke holes through the tissue. I like to open it up so I can take that section out as well yeah. if I need to. If I get in there and I'm just going to do the topaz, I still like to visualize the, the tissue for some reason. It's just, Small incision, yeah, open it, it up, heals up, direct great. visualization. Yeah, I mean, I, I, poking the holes through the skin is uh, completely okay, and that's one of the benefits of this procedure is you can do it without making a decision. But if I'm going to take the patient to the OR to do it, I'm going to make an incision. I'm going to visualize the tissue that I'm, I'm operating on. I just prefer that. Yeah, and it's like a one or two centimeter incision. Yeah, it heals up very quickly. 10x. So this is kind of um, an old procedure that's got a new life. So they used to use this for cataracts uh, to take all those cataracts out, to breed it out, suction it. Now you have perfect vision or close to it. Um, now they use it for tendons, ligaments. Um, I've never actually done one of these. Have you? No, because I've I've had such good success with their competitor uh, with the coblation. Um, Certainly the same idea. I mean, you're doing a controlled injury to the tissue. I think it, it uh, the the downside to doing it percutaneously is that it's unless you're doing an injectable um, amniotic matrix in there, you're missing the opportunity of putting some growth factors in there. I really think that has turned around some really difficult cases in my hands. Where we made the small incision. We we did the micro debridement with you know whatever. You could use this; it wouldn't matter. And then a, apply amniotic tissue, a layer, a patch, an amniotic patch over that. Um, 
to provide growth factors because those those de, de, those dehydrated amniotic patches are, are really locking in some tremendous growth factors that are great for healing. So if you're trying to turn around a, a tendinosis or a fasciosis, um, there's I think there's no better way. Hundred percent agree. In almost all my surgeries, I put stem cells uh, whenever I can. I would say ninety plus percent of the time. Um, your body's missing something as far as healing potential. There's a reason that you get all that scar tissue versus children or babies who, whenever they get a cut, it heals up like nothing ever happened. So whenever we have the opportunity to, I'm a big advocate of putting stem cells in there. And, and, and let's, let's be very specific here. If, you, if you're using dehydrated amniotic tissue, you're really not using stem cells, but you're oh, using... Yes. You're using a dehydrated version, so there's no live cells there. Um, if you're going to use umbilical cord cryopreserved stem cells, which I love, but are not covered by insurance, um, I'd love. I would, you know, we have patients that clearly choose to purchase those and have me use those as an adjunct to their surgery, and I think it's, it's extremely beneficial because it acts like a, a magnet for their own stem cell stem cell population to then move into the area and start fixing things. But when we're talking injectable, desiccated, you know, chopped up amniotic tissue, that's that's a amniotic um, graft, you could say, an amniotic injection. But it's not stem cells because stem cells is really implying you're using live cells. Yeah, no live cells. Most of the times, they're just growth factors and right. things to help push in the right direction. But extremely helpful in the right situation. Yes. Absolutely. So something I do in conjunction with most of my uh, plantar fasciectomies is I do what's called a gastroc procession. It's a lengthening of the tendon, of your Achilles tendon. Um, there's multiple ways of doing this. I do mine using the uh, endoscopic technique also. Um, go in, lengthen the gastroc aponeurosis, which is the attachment of the gastroc muscle belly to the soleus muscle belly, which together form the Achilles tendon. So if we lengthen that, you have some slack on there. And then obviously we're lengthening the plantar fascia. So we're treating them at both ends. Yeah. So there are some folks you, you can have them stretch until the cows come home and, and they're just not getting enough out of it. And you can get an immediate 10 degrees of dorsiflexion, <clears throat> if not more with, uh, yeah, with an endoscopic gastroc. So it's like a strayer, but maybe a little higher. Yeah. And, and you're just doing it endoscopically. Yeah. So it does work really well. Um, we use that in a number of different situations where we're trying to lengthen the, the uh, gastroc aponeurosis or, the, or the, the entire posterior muscle group. Now, if we're going to say a negative about this is that if you're not doing it properly, just like the endoscopic technique, mm -hmm. you can catch the sural nerve. Correct, correct. So if you're not in that, um, that tendon sheath that makes up the uh, Achilles as it goes around the gastroc aponeurosis, um, you're going to catch that sore nerve and you're going to get numbness on the side of your foot now i do have patients after surgery have a little numbness for a couple of days when they get swelling along there right. but then a week or two later they have full sensation but that is an issue with that procedure you have to be you know in the right plane and if you're not you're gonna you're gonna cut that sore nerve now so is that the worst thing in the world i mean it, it's it's a sensory nerve it can cause chronic pain and it can cause a neuroma and that's um you know part part of what, what I can help with. And so folks will get referred to me for that exact problem. And um, we'll have to either repair it with, um, you know, cadaveric tissue, or we just eliminate the nerve entirely and plug it into muscle. So a couple of different options um, to correct that if that happens. But it's a known potential complication of that surgery. So there are people that do an open tendon lengthening mm -hmm. uh, rather than endoscopic. And obviously that takes the risk away, but then obviously you have a larger incision and there's pros and cons to both options. And I'm actually doing that. I, I like, I prefer the a small medial incision and I go in, visualize everything, move the serial nerve out of the way. So I'm I used to do that way. I used to grab it with a coker yeah. and come across with the mesh, yeah. just slowly it works great. Uh, it works great. tease it away. So I'm kind of, it's weird. Like I love doing an endoscopic nerve decompression on the, the forefoot, but I don't do EPFs and I don't do endoscopic gastrox. So I'm kind of, the, I don't know, it's kind of a weird dichotomy. There's more than one way to skin yeah, a cat. Absolutely. MLS laser. So we got one of about. these like three, four years ago. And I'm telling you, I've had them do it on me for plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. This thing works. 
and it and it's unique in that um, the biochemical explanation for why it works is really above my pay grade. There are some very very smart laser physicists in in the UK that that described why this works, and it's actually working on like a mitochondrial level, yeah. which is really really crazy. But it 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 does amazing things in controlling inflammation and improving blood flow of the tissues but that's that's really not even doing it justice so it's it's a, it's a tremendous benefit for Achilles tendonitis where we can't put it's we really don't want to put steroid injections in and around the Achilles there's too many papers showing that's a bad idea I never right and so you could do you know stem cell injections around the Achilles those are those are okay and that's I think those are beneficial but this laser option really does work great and um it's been a, a real a real good thing to have in the practice. We use it for post-op pain. We use it for plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, any sort of itis. Or arthritis in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It has a depth of penetration. Um, so you'd use it for like foot, ankle. You wouldn't use it too much for a hip joint. You can use it for wrists, elbows, uh, superficial joints. Mm-hmm. Same things that you'd use like Voltaren gel for. We have a patient, um, our nurse, who's using it right now, and she loves it. Yeah. We've we've really had um, good success with it. Uh, it, you know, we try to encourage patients to have this be part of the adjunctive things that they do for plantar fasciitis, if they're lingering at all. So if this is if, if their Achilles tendonitis has gotten fifty percent better and then it seems weeks and weeks go by and it's not moving anywhere, we'll throw this into the mix and it and it does do a great job. Yeah, it promotes taking the inflammation down. It promotes blood flow. It promotes collagen production, promotes nerve regeneration. I mean, there's a lot of things that this helps out with. That's the cellular level stuff that I don't get into too deeply with patients because you could go down a rabbit hole with this. It just... Yeah, but it but it is, it's amazing. That, I think the biochemical response, the, the um, bone formation, cartilage formation... Um, but the collagen production is what really, I think, makes an impact on those Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis patients. So you got this, this uh, disorganized collagen that, that needs to be realigned so that it's nice and strong, and this can help do that. And I think that's part of what it does for for pain relief and these degenerative um, uh, fasciosis and tendinosis problems. Stem cell therapy, well. Broadly speaking, stem right. cell therapy. Right. We'll go through, yeah, we can go through a bunch of different options. Um, there are like 3,500 studies. Uh, if you look up um, the latest list in the government website uh, of approved studies using stem cells all over the body for all kinds of things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and uh, amazing um, potential with these things. Unfortunately, you know, this technology is not reimbursable for the most part there are yet. a couple little yet yeah, i'm hoping that that'll change there are a couple of um amniotic based products that i think are covered uh sporadically with certain insurances medicare is looking at that i think covers it for for one particular product right now yeah. um, that we can use but it it's been few and far between so most of this was cash uh and and it's not cheap i mean this stuff was kind of expensive but um, has the potential uh, to attract your own stem cells, which as we get older, I mean, if you look at, if we try to pull stem cells out of a 60-year-old diabetic patient and, and do bone uh, bone marrow uh, analysis, you're going to get maybe one in 450 or one in 500,000 stem cells per 500,000 cells. In umbilical cord tissue, it's one in 10,000. So you have about a 40 or 50 times yield by getting it from a donated umbilical cord. So we so our highest level of stem cell therapy that we're using in the office is um, umbilical cord cryo preserved stem cells, and those are those are not not inexpensive, but that has the most bang for your buck. And when you can inject those near a joint that's inflamed and broken down, you can you can have these patients improve, because these cells can turn into uh, chondrocytes and can turn turn into tissue that that has been deficient. Um, and then the next layer down would be like amniotic fluid, which has some cellular component and some structural component. And then the third option that we have would be, you know, the dehydrated amnio. Yeah, which is covered by insurances, but only at the surgical level. Right. So you can use it in the, in the operating room. Right. And not all stem cell therapies 
are equal. There's some that are far better than others. I mean, a lot of companies have come out recently with pushing their stem cell graphs and the literature isn't out there to support it. And there are some companies that are properly making their graphs, making their um, injectables that have their growth factors, that actually have the literature behind it that show that it works. And, and again, there, I think there's still this disconnect between calling some of these dehydrated products stem cell therapy, and I think that's a little questionable. I don't think that's yeah. fair to do. I think you, when you're talking stem cells, if you're really talking live tissue that you're, yeah. that you're using, uh, you, you, you got to differentiate, I think. And, and the reason these tissues don't cause an immune response is because they are immune privileged. So they don't have the markers on them that will cause an immune response. And so you, you can use someone else's umbilical cord and not ha just like it's not going to it, it, it. You've got the amniotic layer that's protecting the baby from the mom. You know, these tissues are immune privileged so that they don't induce an immune response. So you can use them safely in different patients. And these are like the progenitor cells, the origin Correct. If you need muscle, it turns into muscle. If you need tendon, it turns into tendon. If you need blood flow, vessels, any cartilage, these are things that it can turn into can or help turn. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, plantar fasciitis. Step on a Lego. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, plantar fasciitis, one of the most common things we treat Um I think we have a pretty good protocol. Uh, you know, the, the number of patients that we operate on every year for me personally is still, it's gotta be less than 2% um, because our protocol works so well. And if we can just get buy-in from the patient on what they need to do to keep it at bay, it, it's not like a cold. It isn't going to go away completely and you'll never have a, to deal with it again because it's a biomechanical problem. It's a structural support problem. That you're walking on every yes, day. Exactly. You've got to be part of the solution. So it just takes a, a few little tweaks in your everyday routine and, and avoiding going barefoot and, and making sure that you're in the right shoes. And then also a simple thing that we recommend is get professionally fit for your athletic shoes every two to three years because I, I can't tell you how many patients come in and they've been in, sticking their feet in the wrong size shoe for like decades. So that, that's a really simple step that you can do for yourself every couple of years is just go get professionally fit. And what I mean by that is go to a specialty, a specialty uh, athletic like running shoe store. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, if you go and fit yourself, you're missing an opportunity. Now, if you get professionally fit and then you realize, okay, I love the Nimbus 3000, uh, whoever makes uh, you know your favorite shoe, then you can go online and buy like two or three pair in that size and you know you're going to probably be okay. The other thing is, don't expect your running shoes, even if you don't run in them, are going to last you three years. It's they're just not. So it, one of the things you can look for is on the on the sides and the EVA. If you start seeing wrinkles in the EVA when you push on it, that 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 shoe's probably shot. So yeah. time to move it on, turn it into a you know your your gardening shoe if you want. Um, but that's not so. You don't want to be collecting these and reusing them. I think a lot of people want to want to use. Oh yeah, I've had that pair for like eight years. <laughs> I don't know why I have heel pain. Yeah. So well, yeah, don't, shoot don't changes hang on over time. Yeah, and don't hang on to them. It doesn't doesn't make sense. So, I think swapping them out at least yearly is important. Um, and you can see that the breakdown, you know, in the EVA is one tool to uh, determine when it's time to move that shoe on. Well, that's it for our lecture. If you could like, follow, subscribe. If you have ideas on topics, please uh, send us some options. I mean, I I would love to hear. And if you have questions, by all means, please reach out to us. And we, we are available, uh, These this video is available on YouTube, but we do have, finally we've got our, our, um, our podcast up on Spotify. Apple. Uh, Apple, Podbean, Google, and Stitcher are, um, by the time this one comes out, we'll probably be on there. So I think we can safely say we'll be on all those platforms. And then our videos will be on YouTube. Absolutely. Yep, so definitely like us and subscribe, and uh, we will see you next time on The Pod Doctors. Take care.